we at war. I try not to prepare two speeches on COVID-19. One out of two is not too bad, I think. Um, I will talk about the language that's been used when referring to the current pandemic. It shouldn't be too complicated anyway. Also, the speech starts with a quote. I will go slowly. It's not a difficult quote, um, and it should be fine to interpret. We are at war, certainly in a healthcare war. We are not fighting an army, nor are we fighting another nation. But the enemy is here, invisible, elusive. It progresses. It thus requires a call to arms. We are at war. These are the words that were uttered by French President Emmanuel Macron during a televised speech on Monday the 16th of March. Except, of course, the original would have been in French. This is the BBC translation. This speech um, followed the order that was, had been given by the French government to close all restaurants, cafes and retail stores across the country. As we know, as, as we know um, unprecedented and desperate times call for unprecedented and, why not, desperate measures. This was only, after all, the latest attempt to curb the spread of COVID-19. During his speech, Macron asked his citizens for their cooperation. He said that they would have to make sacrifices. And it's actually quite interesting to look at the language that he used to rally the masses, more specifically at an expression, sentence rather, that I've already used twice. We are at war. Not only that, but the mere fact that he used it for six times during a 20-minute speech. And this is not taking into account any other references that he made to military jargon or the word war itself. It's a call to the arms all right, and one that apparently seems to address our gut feelings and emotions. The pandemic, after all, is progressing and the death toll continues to rise. When I last checked, there were more than 69,500 deaths worldwide. Yet, I cannot shake the feeling that it's quite odd and a bit weird to hear those words, we are at war, in Europe in 2020. Apparently, I'm not the only one either. You just need to Google it and you'll find plenty of articles that talk about just that. The Washington Post, the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Guardian, they all have articles written by journalists and commentators wondering whether indeed we are at war. Politicians and the leader of one well-known superpower have made ample use of military references and terminology when talking about their actions to uh, fight against the current virus. And I've just done it myself, I said fight against. For instance, frontline medical staff were hailed as warriors. The coronavirus was depicted as an invasive enemy and this was something that Donald Trump did himself on Twitter, where else, uh, where he tweeted, the world is at war with a hidden enemy. We will win. It wasn't just the US, however, others followed suit. Governments and politicians in India, China, France, Brazil, just to name a few, uh, unveiled war budgets and promised a triumphant victory. In Europe, leaders invoked the parallel of the Second World War and said that this, the current pandemic, is the greatest crisis since that epochal conflict. Even Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, or Queenie, to quote Blackadder, consciously channeled the Second World War during an address that she gave to the nation on Sunday. She mentioned frontline staff of the NHS and those employed in social care, and she underlined the ultimate sacrifice that so many of them risk and so many of them have already paid. 
Usually, the tendency to recall the Blitz, the Dunkirk spirit, and Winston Churchill is, let's face it, cringeworthy. It didn't do Boris Johnson any favour, and if anything, when he did it, it only elicited cheers from toiler roll stockpiling Brexiteers. However, the Queen actually knows what she's on about. Before she was a queen, when she was still a princess, one of her first actions as in her official role was to give an address to all of the children of the Commonwealth. This happened in 1940. At the time, children that came from all the countries of the Commonwealth were scattered around the world and she decided to say a few words to comfort them. Going back to the speech that she gave this Sunday, however, her best touch was referring to We'll Meet Again, a 1939 ballad made famous by singer Dame Vera Lynn, which is a poignant British song that became well known and worldwide known all throughout uh, World War II. So much so that it even featured in the final scene of Stanley Kubrick's Doctor Strangelove, albeit with a bit of a weird twist, but that's Kubrick for you. Evoking wartime sentiment works well on the masses. It boosts national pride, all everyone um, rallies behind the leader, and all of the efforts are focused on defeating the common enemy. Except maybe. Sometimes it works a little bit too well. By nature, and this is something that we tend to forget, war is divisive. There are two main opponents that are locking horns and ultimately trying to erase each other off the face of the earth. Sadly, the COVID-19 pandemic has spawned many divisions. Racism once again reared its ugly head and found the perfect breeding ground in the anxiety and panic that this pandemic is creating. For instance, China and the US have been engaging in a blame game on who is to be blamed for the virus. The US are scapegoating China. For instance, they're referring to coronavirus as the Chinese virus. Now, this is something that Donald Trump himself has done and probably continues to do. And they're also fueling all sorts of conspiracy, conspiracy theories um, related to China having launched the virus on purpose. China has decided to retaliate by sending help to all US allies around the world to steal the limelight, so to speak. Um, Italy is a case in point. They can also rely on a well-oiled propaganda machine that allows them to then advertise their efforts as saviors of the world. Let's not forget that both the European Union and the US have also closed borders to foreigners or those coming from outside. This on the surface is to protect citizens both in the EU and the US, but obviously has created divisions. And if you want more tangible examples, um, Chinese nationals have been verbally and sometimes physically abused all over the world. There have been cases reported from Southampton where a group of Chinese people were targeted and attacked publicly, but also cases in Sheffield and London, to talk about the UK, uh, but also in Australia and all over the US. Chinese nationals have been verbally abused, physically assaulted, pelted with eggs, you name it. On the 19th of March, a reporting center was set up in the US. It's a website available in six Asian languages, and this is to allow people to flag up incidents of racial abuse against people of Asian um, descent. Um, if you want to um, provide a report, all you need to do is to submit uh, the incident report and provide any appropriate details. In its first two weeks, the website received 1,135 reports, which is a staggering number. According to statistics published by the website itself, women are twice as likely to be harassed than men. This is probably hardly surprising in today's day and age. And in 6.3% of cases, 
children or young people were on the receiving end of abuse. That said, it's not just foreigners that are being discriminated against. The language of war ends up dividing communities as well. If on the one hand we have the selfless work of volunteers that are helping the elderly, putting their lives at risk and their safety at risk by going out and shopping and delivering groceries to those that are most vulnerable, their work is being overshadowed by legions of panicked shoppers stripping shelves in supermarket in a stupid attempt to preempt wartime rationing. In rural France, signs appeared everywhere warning Parisians that were fleeing the capital to go elsewhere. On the surface, again, this was because small towns cannot cope with such large swathes of people, but it could smack of racism. In Italy, when the lockdown already in place in 10 northern towns was extended to pretty much the whole of northern Italy, um, there was a mass exodus of people traveling from the north to the south because they were scared they were going to be blocked in the north. Um, except this obviously hit the, hit the headlines everywhere and exacerbated the already quite sharp north-south divide that we have in Italy. And this is not all. Some governments around the world have assumed emergency powers. Many have limited human rights, such as the freedom of movement by closing borders, for instance. And in some cases, they've also limited the freedom of speech. After all, there are now troops patrolling the streets almost everywhere from Italy to Peru. Wartime democracy could be further at risk if parliaments and courts were to be suspended. That, now, that has not happened yet, but we'll have to see. Elections have already been postponed. Local polls in the UK and in France have been put off. So the same applies to the Democratic primary in Ohio, in the US. And many are now waiting with bated breath to see what will happen to the US presidential election, which is supposed to be taking place in November. What now, therefore? Well, it's fair to say that Europe and Trump's America do not see eye to eye on several fronts. Winning the battle against the virus is important, and there's no doubt in that. However, for some, winning the wider geopolitical and moral argument may even be more significant. One thing in all of this is certain. The war on COVID-19 has already produced some startling changes in society. For one, more and more people are realizing that working from home isn't too bad after all, and this applies to large enterprises too. The economy will also need some time to recover, which will mean a gradual um, come back to work. As The Guardian states, it is often said that things will never be the same again after a major conflict. Also, historically, war leads to a revolution. Therefore, the likes of Trump and Bolsonaro, not to mention Boris, Jump, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, who promote this military language, better be ready. Thank you. <laughs>